In this lecture, um, you're going to get a crash course in one of two backgrounds to the world of the Gospels, to the world of the New Testament, to the world of Jesus. Backgrounds are really important because if we don't understand the historical backgrounds, and in the case of early Christianity, there's two. There's the Greco-Roman world and the Jewish world. If we don't understand backgrounds, we end up misunderstanding the context of texts uh, found, for instance, in the New Testament. And just to give you an example of this, if you take the expression, I love this course, and if I were to just write that on a board in a classroom and ask people, what does this mean? I'm going to get various responses to that based on the context that students assume those words were written in. So if I write, I love this course, and if I put it on a, uh, on a chalkboard or if I put it on a whiteboard in a classroom, students are going to assume that the context of those words, I love this course, refers to the course they're presently in. But if I give no context to those words, I love this course could have to do with uh, the, whatever uh, particular course we are eating in a, in a fancy dinner that has three or four or five courses. If I was saying it and, and you happen to be a NASCAR fan, you might, you might think I'm referring to uh, the racetrack at Daytona or, or Talladega or someplace like that. In fact, if you just write words on a board and don't explain the inflections that are used when those words are said, you may not know if somebody's being sarcastic when they say, I love this course. Maybe, maybe they're, they don't really love it and they're being sarcastic in the way they express this. So context, background, is, is very important, especially for understanding ancient texts. And when it comes to the world of the early Christians, there's two backgrounds, as I said. There's the Greco-Roman world, the world of Greece and the world of Rome. I'll explain why those are combined here in a second. And then you have the world of Judaism, Second Temple Judaism, which we'll discuss later on. So, I, in all fairness, I, I'm going to give you enough information to be 100% dangerous with the Greco-Roman world. Uh, studying the Greco-Roman world is is difficult when you go off to be a New Testament scholar or to study early Christianity. You also basically have to become a classicist at the same time because you have to learn about the worlds of Greece and the worlds of Rome and the religions of these 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 uh, empires of, of Greece and Rome. You have to know all of these things to better understand what's going on in early Christianity. Now, if you follow along in your notes, the individual who changes everything for the ancient Mediterranean world is a man named Alexander the Great. And so let's put him around the year 333 BCE. So he's well before the time of Jesus. But what he does, Alexander the Great, is he brings with him something that scholars call Hellenization he Hellenizes the world. Uh, in fact, scholars today, particularly scholars of early Christianity, will say he creates what we today would call the Greco-Roman world. Now, if, if you're an ancient historian and you work in the field of classics, you, you usually split up the worlds of Greece and Rome. So if you're a classicist and you study Greek, and you study ancient Greece, or you study Athens, or you study Homer, uh, you, you don't see the world of worlds of Greece and Rome colliding. But, but New Testament scholars combine uh, these two worlds for practical reasons, because they do, in fact, overlap. And the reality is, the Roman world is borrowing from the Greek world. So when I use this expression, Greco-Roman, it's, it's shorthand for saying Greece and Rome and the overlap of the worlds of Greece and the worlds of Rome, even though uh, one is using Greek, one is using Latin. Uh, the reality is the, the Roman world is also borrowing from the Greek world, going back to Alexander the Great in this process of Hellenization. So what Alexander does is he Hellenizes the world. He, in, in other words, this, this word Hellenization to Hellenize something means to make it Greek. If, if you remember several years ago, there was a film called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. 
there's a scene or two in that film where the father in the film, if, if you give him a, him, a, him a word, an English word, he can tell you, rightly or wrongly, he can tell you where this comes from if you take it all the way back to ancient Greek or if you talk to him about an idea or an invention, he can tell you how this, this goes back to the world of ancient Athens. Now, he's not necessarily right on everything he's saying, but, but, but this is really what happens in the process of Hellenization. Everything becomes Greek. And this is going to include later on Judaism and Christianity. And people often don't think of, of it this way, of, of Judaism and Christianity, even, even though they're separate things, they are still highly influenced by the Greco-Roman world. They are part of the Greco-Roman world. And as I said, not just the Romans, but everyone is borrowing from the Greeks. And they're making these ideas, these Greek ideas, these Hellenistic ideas, they're making them their own. Now, the brilliance of this is Alexander is one of our first sort of empire builders in the Western tradition. He's out to conquer the world. He wants to create an empire, and I'll talk more about Alexander here in a second. But as preliminary to this, the brilliant thing Alexander does, and anyone who is bent on creating an empire needs to learn from this, is if you're going to create an empire and you're going to conquer a diverse group of people with different religions, different laws, and different currencies, different languages. The first thing you need to do is unify all of them. So what you do is you give them a common language, in this case, Greek. What you do is give them common laws and common customs, in this case, Greek. What you do is give them a common currency. And the, and the brilliance of this is that Everyone can talk to everyone else. They can trade with one another. They can work with one another. Now, the nefarious evil side of this is you start destroying cultural distinctiveness. I mean, this is no different when Europeans come over and conquer the New World and colonize the New World and start telling Native Americans, you must become European. Well, one of the things that Alexander does is he spreads the language of Greek known as Koine Greek. This is also the language of the New Testament. Koine Greek, as I've, I've told you previously, means common Greek or vulgar Greek. It's the Greek of the streets. So what Alexander does is he conquers this territory, that territory, and says, look, you can now all talk and trade with one another because the official language is Greek. And, and what this means is Greek, Koine Greek, becomes the lingua franca. It becomes the common language of Alexander's empire. And this is it, it, similar to what's happening or has happened with the English language. Of A lot of people throughout the world, if they want to compete in the modern world, need to know English. And so if, if you're bent on imperial expansion, one of the first things you do, if, if this is something you want to do, but I hope it's not. If, if you want to conquer the world, you need your empire. You need subjects in your empire to all be speaking the same language. Now, in a sense, this makes sense on paper. This is exactly what you want to do. And a lot of people welcomed this. But it creates problems for other people because what, what Alexander is ultimately doing is he's taking away distinctiveness, uh, which is often what you do when you colonize other people. And he's creating what's called a common ethnos. He's creating a common ethnicity, a common group of people who all think, believe, act the same way. Now, this is fine unless you're a Jew or later on you're a Christian. If you're a Jew, you, you already think of yourself as distinct because you believe in the one true God of the universe. If you're a Jew, this is a problem because you have your own unique religious tradition. You also have been chosen by the one true God of the universe to be a chosen ethnos, a chosen people, a unique people. But what Alexander wants is he wants this Greek word oikumene, from which we get our English term ecumenical. He wants to create a common world where everyone thinks, believes, behaves the same, speaks the same language. And the problem is, if you're a Jew or 
later on in history a Christian, you can't totally buy into this because you see yourself as separate because of your God or because of your Messiah, Jesus. Now, Alexander was not Greek. He was a Macedonian. His father was Philip II, who was the king of Macedonia. Alexander himself was born around the year 356 BCE. He was educated by the great Aristotle around the year 342 BCE. And he rose to power after his father was assassinated in the year 336 BCE. And a few years later, he's going to start this process of imperial expansion throughout the ancient Mediterranean world. And he creates a gigantic empire. I mean, the, the empire after him is going to become even greater, and that's going to be the Roman Empire. But he creates this gigantic empire. He unites a lot of the ancient Mediterranean world. So places today like Syria, Turkey, Egypt, Greece. But as often happens with empires, the unity of that empire starts to fall apart after his death. And what happens is this empire he created starts splitting between his generals. One general will take Egypt. One general will take Syria. And then these individuals will fight among one another. The rulers that, that take over after Alexander, his generals, are in Greek called the Diadochi. Uh, Diadochi simply means, uh, it's a Greek word that simply means the successors. But what happens is, is a once united empire begins to fragment. And of course, this causes a lot of problems for the people that are under the various generals of Alexander after Alexander dies. Because now there's a power struggle and there's a power vacuum. Well, all of this will lead to some classic features that are prominent in the Greco-Roman world. And so I just want to go through some of these. And as we get to the world of early Christianity and to the world of the, the New Testament, it's important to keep these things in mind because, because these are the features that are also there, even in Israel-Palestine, which has been Hellenized. One of the most important things in the Greco-Roman world is the creation of something known as the polis, P-O-L-I-S. A polis is a Greek city-state. All city-states, all Greek city-states are similar in structure. They, they kind of work the same way. And again, if you want an empire to work, this is what you want to do. You want all your cities within the empire working the same way, being structured the same way, having the same sort of governmental and economic structures. It makes things easier. Because when you travel from one polis to another polis within the empire, you basically know how things are going to work. What also happens is there becomes this mutual dependence between the Greek city-state and the countryside surrounding the Greek city-state. So the country and the polis start working together. And they start helping one another. And this creates economic growth and all sorts of other things. In fact, uh, this is just an aside, but... Paul makes use of these Greek city-states in the New Testament. Paul doesn't go to the countryside. He, he actually establishes churches, house churches, in Greek city-states. That's just what he does. It makes sense to him to, to, to establish a base of operations uh, within a polis, not out in the countryside. And so in many respects, the early Christian movement of Paul and his followers is an urban movement. Within the Greek city-states, you also get a very well-thought-out Greco-Roman education program. And Greco-Roman education is called Paideia. On your notes, you can see it there. It's P-A-I-D-E-I-A, -E Paideia. And what Paideia is, is this is a system of forming a young boy, usually of the upper classes, uh, usually a citizen, into a proper man, a proper man of the polis, a proper man of the Greek city-state. You're going to learn things like rhetoric. You're going to learn things like administrative functions. Now, now, girls sometimes could get some form of this Greek education, but 
it was typically for boys. And if girls got this education, it was usually done sort of ad hoc within the home, within the uh, Greco-Roman household. But, but boys had, had a formal system that they, that they went through. And this education usually took place in something called the Greek gymnasium, which comes from um, gymnos, which means naked. And the reason why uh, I, I, it's naked uh, is that exercise in the gymnasium, where you also went for your formal education, exercise, wrestling, athletic contests, were all done in the nude. Now, this becomes a problem for, for, for Jews and Christians um, later on because they don't want to engage in uh, this form of behavior. They, do, they don't want to exercise in the nude. But if you're a good Greek or you're a good Roman, this is just what you did. And you usually began your, your education by learning basic math, basic arithmetic, and, and you started learning through, through the works of the great Greek writer Homer. So you started learning through the Iliad, the Odyssey, which is how many people still down to this day when they go off to university. This is how they learn Greek. Within these Greek city-states, there also developed a very elaborate uh, political, or very elaborate, I should say, political institutions, political structures. One of the most fundamental of these was something called the demos. Demos is a Greek word which simply equals the people. And in these Greek city-states, what this referred to is all male citizens. And from demos, we get our, our word that we, that we all love, democracy. Democracy is rule by the people. It's rule by those who are part of the demos. And democracy, the invention of democracy... Uh, it comes before Alexander. It really goes back to, to Athens, classical Athens, around the end of the 6th century BCE. And yet, as is the case with the U.S. Constitution and the founding fathers of this country, democracy in, in its original form does not include everyone. When we say we the people in its original context, there are people in the United States originally that were excluded from that. And the same thing is true when you go back to ancient Greek democracy. Foreigners are not included. Women are not included. Slaves are not included in this democracy. They're excluded from it. But the most fundamental institution in these Greek city-states is, is the demos. It's the people referring to all male citizens. And they have a say in what happens within the Greek city-state. Now, a smaller version or a smaller group exists within the demos, and that is the boule, B-O-U-L-E. The boule is a smaller council that actually comes out of this citizen body. There could be 50 men, there could be a few more, there could be a few less. And what members of the boule do is they get together and they discuss new issues that happen to arise within the polys that they're a part of. They talk about those issues. They might vote on these new issues. They will explain these new issues to, to others within the city. And then there was also something known as the ecclesia. The ecclesia is, is what you call the gathered body of the demos. Interestingly, ecclesia is the word that is used in the New Testament to refer to what we call the church, or more specifically, back in the time of the New Testament writers, house churches. There are plenty of other words that the New Testament writers could have used to describe a body of Christians or a gathering of Christians. They could have used the Greek word for synagogue, or the two Greek words for synagogue. But instead, for one reason or another, they chose this political word, ecclesia, that's connected with the Greek polis. And this has, has led academics and historians to wonder, why did people like Paul and his letters do this? Why did the gospel writers do this? 
Does that mean the early Christians are trying to say that the early Christian gatherings were political associations or political movements? Now, if you remember back from that letter of Pliny and Trajan, um, Pliny seems to think that the early Christians might be a political association. Uh, and so, so, so there are all kinds of questions that are still there that we don't have concrete answers to as to why the Christians chose ecclesia as the term to talk about house churches or early Christian gatherings. Beyond the political institutions, Greek city-states had theaters. And if you go to any of these, these ancient Greek cities, many of these, these theaters are still intact. Theaters were, were a big part of ancient Greek and Roman life. Some language of the theater also seems to be there in, in the words of Jesus in the Gospels. And these theaters are very, very elaborate. You could flood the part of the theaters and, and have these elaborate naval battles. You could play games in these theaters. I mean, this was, this was entertainment for people. And this was something that Jews and Christians also had to wrestle with. Could they be part of these spectacles? Could they, could they go and watch these, these, these performances? Some thought yes, some thought no. But, but theaters were a typical feature of ancient Greek and even Roman cities. And then you also have things like the public baths, which of course were much more common in ancient Roman cities than in ancient Greek cities, but, but they were there in ancient Greek cities. Many of the baths were, were, were co-ed, some were not. And you might already be going there in your head, so let me just be very blunt. All kinds of things went on in public bathhouses. And I mean that in terms of discussing politics, making deals, business deals, etc. And I also mean that in terms of sex. All kinds of things went on in public bathhouses. And again, this was something, a feature of these Greco-Roman cities that early Christians had to really think through and Jews had to think through as well. Could they be part of this, even though public baths were, were, were such an important part of these cities? Now, when you start spreading, like Alexander did, a common currency, a common language, common laws, common philosophy. You also try to spread religion. Alexander and others were not big on saying, look, if, if, if you aren't worshiping the Greek gods and goddesses, or if you aren't worshiping later on the Roman gods and goddesses, you will be punished. Instead, what, what, what tends to happen is something known as religious syncretism. Syncrasis in, in ancient Greek or synchrosis in, in ancient Greek, means to mix together. And just to give you an example of this, you, you, you basically, if you're a Roman and you, you take on Greek ideas, you would say, okay, the head god, the head deity, the chief god of the Greek pantheon of gods is Zeus. So a Roman says, that's fine, we have that too, but his name is Jupiter. So you just combine Jupiter and Zeus. If you're a good Greek or a good Roman, you would look at the Jews and you would say, okay, you have this one God called Yahweh. Well, Yahweh could just be Jupiter and just be Zeus, so just combine it all together. Now, syncretism works for people that believe in multiple gods and goddesses like the Greeks and the Romans. It does not work for individuals who believe in one God, who are monotheists like the Jews and the Christians. Because you're, you're exclusivist. You, you believe that there is one right God. So you have a very hard time when somebody comes along and says, just mix together your deity with our deities, plural, and everything will be fine. Now, Alexander and others were a bit more tolerant of this than the Romans, and I'll explain that in a moment. But it really was a problem if, if you're a Jew and you say, look, I, I believe in one God. Or if you're a Christian and say, we have one Lord. His name is Jesus. It's, it's not these other gods and goddesses.
But Alexander was using religious syncretism, the mixing together of religions, as, as a form of propaganda. It was a technique to promote a kind of unifying ideology. Hey, your gods, your goddesses, that's fine. Just combine them with ours. Now, some religious historians look back at the Greeks and Romans and say, in a sense, they were much more tolerant of other religions than ancient Jews and Christians. Because when you're an exclusivist, like ancient Jews and ancient Christians, where they have one God who is the true God, then you become less tolerant because you can't mix these things together. They don't mix and match. The other thing, though, that came with Alexander is the concept of the divine ruler, which becomes, which is expanded very much so under the Roman emperors. Alexander didn't just claim he was a king or he was an emperor creating this great empire. He also took the next step and said, I'm divine. Now, this practice would become more important under Roman emperors like Augustus, who would say, not only am I divine, but I'm the son of God. I'm God on earth. Obviously, this is a huge, gigantic problem if you are a Jew or a Christian, because it's one thing to have a king. It's another thing to deal with a king who says they are divine, especially if they want you to worship them. But this really isn't that big of a deal for many people in the ancient world. There, there were these individuals called Theos Anor, divine men, Hercules, Apollonius of Tiana, many others, in which there was this combination of divinity and humanity that came together in one person. In fact, many people that likely first heard the stories of Jesus thought, big deal. People like Alexander, people like Augustus, Caesar Augustus, People like I already mentioned, Hercules, Apollonius of Tiana. There are plenty of individuals, examples from the ancient world, where the divine and the human have coalesced and become something special. So the concept of the divine man was, was real in the ancient world, and it didn't bother people as much as it bothers us. It got tricky if you were a Jew or a Christian, because eventually a divine man, a, an Alexander or a Caesar Augustus, might want you to bow before them and worship them as a god on earth. Well, eventually, as we move into the Roman world, we get a social structure that's hierarchical and affects everything in society, particularly the Roman household. Now, there's uh, on the e-learning website, there, there's a... Um, handout for you that, that shows this pyramid structure of how Roman society works. When you think of ancient Greco-Roman society, and this you should think this way when it comes to Judaism and when it comes to Christianity, everything is in a hierarchy. There is somebody on the top of that hierarchy, and then there are a bunch of people at the bottom of that hierarchy. So I can't stress enough when we talk about the Greco-Roman world, Everything exists within a hierarchy. The universe is hierarchical. The sun is higher than the moon. The sun is higher than the other stars. The empires are in hierarchies. The emperors are on the top of the pyramid. The household is in a hierarchy. The husband, the father, the paterfamilias, the head of the household who is a male is at the top of that hierarchy. In fact, if you're a Roman Catholic, you are familiar with this hierarchy because Roman Catholicism borrowed the hierarchy of the Greco-Roman world and brought it into the world of Roman Catholicism. The whole idea of Pope at the top of the pyramid, then bishops, cardinals, priests, deacons, and then the laity at the bottom, that is right out of the world of Greece and Rome, particularly the Roman household. Well, at the top of every Roman household is the paterfamilias. The paterfamilias is Latin for the father of the house, the head of the house. Whether you are rich, whether you are poor, the head of the household is the man, is the father, is the husband. 
And the entire reason for putting the man at the top of the pyramid is because in larger society, at the top of the pyramid is the true paterfamilias, which is the emperor. Now, if you're looking at the little picture I gave you of a, a, a Roman household, one of the things you'll notice in looking at this is that missing from it is the wife. The wife is not a member of her husband's household. And this is particularly true in the world of the Roman Empire. Wives don't belong to the household of their husbands. They belong to the households of their fathers. The reason for this is, is purely based on money, like so many things. It's a way for upper-class Roman men to keep the money within the family, as opposed to transferring it over to, uh, to your son-in-law. But daughters can be part of the paterfamilias' household. Slaves are certainly members of the Roman household. But again, everything trickles down. So there's one person on top, and then it goes down from there. And that hierarchy is, is there to organize society. So you start in the house, and then that moves out into the way that the religions work, the cosmos, the universe works, and ultimately it's how the empire works. So all of this is meant, the household is meant to socialize everyone into understanding that at the top of that pyramid is the ruler, is the emperor. Now just briefly, slaves are, are a common feature of households. They, they're also a common feature of early Christian households. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the elite classes or the poor classes. All kinds of people own slaves. Even the poor could own slaves. It's very important to understand that slavery in the Greco-Roman world does not work like slavery in the United States during the 19th century and before. Slavery is never a good thing. But we're not talking about the antebellum south here of the United States. After a period of time, masters did free their slaves. And when those slaves were freed, those slaves not only became freed persons under Roman law, but they also gained Roman citizenship. As a friend of mine, uh, Dale Martin, in a, in a great book that he wrote called Slavery of Salvation, puts it, slavery actually can be a form of salvation in the ancient world because slavery might be a way for you as a non-Roman citizen to gain Roman citizenship. In other words, slavery is a vehicle to upward social mobility. That's not at all how this works in the United States or did work in the United States, and it's certainly not how slavery works in many other parts of the world. It's also important to realize that when we talk about slavery in the Greco-Roman world, it is not based on skin color. So people from the Mediterranean basin can have slaves from the Mediterranean basin. So slavery is actually a pathway, or can be a pathway to citizenship. It, it, it's a pathway, it's a means to salvation. The other thing that, in part of this crash course, you should know about the Greco-Roman world is the economic system of the Greco-Roman world is based on something called the patron-client system. I point this out because every now and then you have people, especially in modern American society, trying to tell you, you can find capitalism in the ancient world, or you can find capitalism in the New Testament. On the other end, you have people saying, look, you can find socialism or Marxism in the New Testament. Historically, you cannot find those modern economic systems in the ancient world or as, as particularly within early Christianity in the New Testament. You might find things that sound capitalistic or sound socialist, but that's not what they are. So since we're playing the role of historians here, it's anachronistic to say modern economic systems existed back in the ancient world, because they just don't. Nobody had thought of them yet. 
What you do have is this elaborate patron-client system that is built on this hierarchical structure. Clients are people somewhere further down in the pyramid who will go to people further up and ask them for favors. It's kind of a mafia-style system in which you go and say, look, I, I need you to do this, this, and this for me, or I need you to loan me this money. And then you have obligations you have to fulfill. You as a client have to honor your patron. This is also a system that puts a lot of people into debt. And this works all throughout society, at the highest levels, at the lowest levels. This is a society that is also built on the principles of honor and the principles of shame. And so if you're a patron, what you want is your clients to honor you. And that may include simply showing up, believe it or not, in the mornings outside of your house and just simply saying out loud in front of your patron's house how great your patron is. And as I said, it means you as your client, you're indebted to your patron. And that may last your entire life. Within this patron-client system, there is no such thing as a middle class. Basically, if you look at the economic structure of the ancient world, you have the 1%, which includes people like the emperor, the Roman senators, the Roman equestrians, and then you have everybody else. But when you go down to that 99%, there's a hierarchy within that 99%. Most people are living right at the subsistence level of existence. They're making just enough to get by. Some people are a bit above that. Some people are below that. But even within that 99% system, there, there is a hierarchy and there are patrons and there are clients. And again, all of this is done to reflect hierarchy. Now, everything I'm talking about up to this point is, is idealistic. It, it, no, the patron-client system doesn't work ideally all of the time. No, syncretism doesn't work ideally all of the time. Households don't work ideally all of the time. And unfortunately, when we look at the ancient world, our surviving literature of how it, this is all supposed to work comes from the upper classes. We don't know how all of this worked itself out among the lower classes. But if you're looking at the patron-client system, much like Reaganomics in, in the 1980s, the ideal was that the patron-client system would allow wealth to trickle down from the patrons to the clients. Did it work? No, but trickle-down theories never work, contrary to what many people keep believing. Well, we have to talk about, if we're talking about the Greco-Roman world, we have to talk about the rise of Julius Caesar and his adopted son Octavian because Julius Caesar and the rise of his adopted son Octavian creates Roman imperialism. And Octavian, who later becomes Augustus, is going to be the emperor when Jesus is born. And if you want to understand the Roman Empire and all that the Roman Empire is doing during the time of Jesus and the time of the New Testament writers, you really have to go back to Rome's first sovereign emperor, and that is Octavian or Caesar Augustus. We've all heard of Julius Caesar, and I, I won't spend a lot of time talking about him. We've all heard the, the phrase, et, uh, et tu uh, Brutus, et tu Brute, you too Brutus. We might even have read somewhere... Uh, Shakespeare's uh, play, Julius Caesar. At the end of the Roman Republic, Julius Caesar is assassinated by conservative forces in the Roman Senate who are absolutely terrified that Julius Caesar was getting ready to make himself a dictator of the Roman Empire. Doesn't look like that's what Julius Caesar was going to do. So several individuals, even people that were close to Caesar, hatched a plot against Caesar, stabbed him multiple times, and killed him on the floor of the Roman Senate. This is where you get that whole beware of the Ides of March. Because in 44 BCE, March 15th, Julius Caesar is assassinated. It's the end of the Roman Republic. 
Now, historians that look back on this will say, and I think this is an important lesson of sometimes killing the person you think is going to become dictator uh, is not a good idea because what comes after that is worse. So what happens is after Julius Caesar is killed, much like when Alexander dies and his generals start fighting over who's in control, uh, there, there's a power vacuum in Rome. And the republic starts to fall apart and you start to get civil war and you start to have all of these problems. It's not good if, if you're part of the Roman uh, people because you, you, you've lost stability and you want Caesar back. Well, Julius Caesar had done something rather brilliant. He had adopted a man named, a boy named Octavian, who will later become Augustus. He will change his name to Augustus. And Octavian will avenge Julius Caesar's death. This will lead to the famous Battle of Octium in 31 BCE, fights between Mark Anthony and Cleopatra and Octavian. And eventually, long story short, Octavian will win at the Battle of Octium. He will go back to Rome triumphant and he will essentially turn himself into Rome's first sovereign emperor, which is where he will change his name from Octavian Octavius to Augustus. And Augustus means the one who is to be worshipped. And yet Augustus will create all of this propaganda in which he insists, I'm not an emperor, I'm not a king. He will call himself a, a princeps, which means the first among equals. And so he'll tell those on the floor of the Roman Senate. No, 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 I, I'm the first among senators. We're equals, brothers. But he knows what he's doing. It's, it's all a lie. It's all propaganda because he knows, no, I, I, I'm really the first emperor and I'm really the first dictator. That thing you feared Julius Caesar was going to be my adopted father, that's exactly what I'm going to become. And then he takes the whole idea of the divine ruler to a whole new level. He decrees that when people like his adopted father, Julius Caesar, die, at death, they become gods. And this is absolutely brilliant because the mythology is, is, is this, that well, when an emperor dies, if you're the son of that emperor or the adopted son of that emperor and the emperor becomes a god, the previous dead emperor becomes a god, that means you're the son of God. And Augustus takes this so far that on coins and statues and inscriptions, he, he starts to use the title, Caesar Augustus, the Son of God. And don't think this doesn't impact early Jews and early Christians. In fact, we'll see this when we get to the Gospel of Mark, that one of the first things the writer of Mark tells us is, Jesus is the Son of God. And that isn't just a religious statement. That's a political statement. Because everybody in the Roman Empire knows the true Son of God is the ruling Roman Emperor. And so when Augustus dies, the same pattern will repeat itself, that Augustus goes from being Son of God to being a God, and then the next Emperor becomes Son of Augustus, Son of God. Indulging in this Augustus also begins to create a very elaborate mythology, which is just pure political propaganda. And he's really good at it. He creates this thing called the Pax Romana, which means the peace of Rome. And he brags about it in an autobiography that he wrote or has written called the Res Gestae Divi Augusti, the divine deeds, the deeds rather of the divine Augustus. Now, it's all pure propaganda. I mean, some of it's true, but it's a lot of it's just lies. But he talks about how he is spreading true peace as a savior to the world. He, 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 he paints himself as a messianic figure. A messiah, a savior for, for, for all kinds of people, Greeks, Romans, Jews, etc., barbarians, etc. He talks about how only he can return Rome to its golden age of prosperity and morality. 
I mean, when you think about this, politicians in America still do the same thing. If we could just get a leader that would get us back to the good old days. That's exactly what Augustus is doing, but he knows he's manipulating all this. He knows none of this is true. The irony of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, is that it's peace that is spread by imperial conquest. It's peace by way of the sword. What essentially happens, and Augustus is frank about this, and, and the rest just dies. He says, look, I'm going to show up at your doorstep. You either submit to Roman rule, or we're going to kill you. And if you submit to Roman rule, we're going to help you out. So what Augustus does is he, he turns himself into the great patron of the Roman Empire. He is the ultimate patron of patrons. Everybody else is simply a client. This will lead to an elaborate tax scheme that will fund the empire. It will lead to these elaborate marriage laws that on the surface look like they're, they're, they're the, the, the equivalent of, of a modern family, family values movement. He starts talking about patriotism and nationalism for the empire. He, he, he engages in censuses throughout the empire. In fact, one of these is talked about in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He then creates aqueducts, so water is flowing. There's plumbing throughout the empire. He creates this amazing Roman road system, without which Christianity never would have spread. I mean, things start to get safe with this Roman road system. You can get mail between places quickly. You can travel from place to place and Assume you're, you're, you're going to survive and not be attacked by bandits because there's going to be Roman soldiers along that road protecting you. Uh, Paul, for instance, in the New Testament, made use of that road system. But all of this, all of this is a very elaborate propaganda system. Because underneath it, what you have is imperialism. What you have is... Uh, an emperor that wants to colonize the entire world and make it Roman. And even though he might act like he's tolerant, he's not. And one of those places that gets colonized by Rome is Israel-Palestine. When you open the Gospels, there are Roman soldiers. Jesus is condemned under a Roman governor named Pontius Pilate. Crucifixion is a Roman form, not a Jewish form, of capital punishment and torture. Jews do not like the Romans, especially in Israel. They want them out of the land. This is a highly toxic political environment. And many Jews rebelled against Roman imperial rule. Some tried to adapt, but some said, no, we're not living under this. Now, technically speaking, the Romans, like the Greeks, do not force others to convert to the Roman ways or to Roman religions. But this gets really problematic if you're a Jew or a Christian because you're a monotheist. You believe in one God. The Romans will look the other way if you're, you're not going to go to the temple of Jupiter or the temple of uh, Mars, or the temple of, the, you name it. They're not going to care that much. But if you aren't going to participate in honoring the emperor as divine, or even worshiping the emperor, and what's known as the imperial cult, if you're not going to offer incense when you should to the emperor, if you're not going to worship some of the state gods and goddesses, if you're not going to participate in the religious festivals on certain calendar days, honoring the state gods and goddesses, there's a problem. Because the Romans believe that misfortune happens when a group of people within the Roman Empire say, we're not going to do that. And so if you're a Jew or a Christian and you, you won't offer some incense to the emperor or what have you, and then a calamity strikes the Roman Empire, you're going to get blamed. 
when you go back and look at that letter of Pliny and Trajan, this really, I think, is Pliny's concern of if we have this renegade group and they're not doing the right things for the emperor, for the state gods and goddesses, this could be problematic. In fact, the, the, the Romans even go to the Jews and the Christians and say, look, we don't really care what you believe about the emperor, about our gods and goddesses. Just cross your fingers and, and just go through the motions at least. Now, some Christians, some Jews do do this, but many do not. And what eventually starts to happen in the history of early Christianity, and I think you can already see this, especially in the Gospels and in the writings of Paul, is that the early Christians start saying, look, if Jesus is Lord, Caesar can't be Lord. Caesar can't be God if we have another God. And this is the same problem that happens with the Jews. If Yahweh is God and there is one true God of the universe, it can't be the emperor. And so as tolerant as the Greco-Roman world might be, eventually that world is going to clash and collide with the Jews and the Christians. And so in the next lecture, we will start talking about the world of ancient Judaism called Second Temple Judaism. And again, you'll have a crash course in this. You won't know everything you need to know about this. But keep some of these things in mind when you go and start reading the literature of early Christianity. The Pax Romana is sitting there. It's, it's everybody understands this. They understand divine men. They understand the role of emperor. They understand hierarchy and the household. In fact, many of these things are adopted by the early Christians and some by the early Jews. And, and many of these things, when they're adopted, for instance, by the early Christians, they're Christianized. Early Christian households are totally based on the Roman household system of hierarchy. The difference is it's not the emperor at the top. It's not the husband, it's not a man who's head of the household, it's God or it's Jesus. But they're adopting all of these cultural patterns because this is the world that they live in.